This is the Theory of Need in Marx by Agnes Heller. Um, this is the introduction, which was written by Ken Coates and Stephen Bodington. Theories of underconsumption, according to Keynes, hiberna hibernated until J.A. Hobson flung himself with an un unavailing ardor against the ranks of orthodoxy. The theory of need has been totally neglected in Keynes and all other economic orthodoxies. This is surprising because the world at large innocently believes that the whole purpose of economic activity, of production and distribution, is to satisfy human needs and that economists are those who make their special concern the ways and means of doing so in the works of economists or the history of economic thought, there are analyses written at great length and with great complexity of demand and supply, money, the market and market competition. But there is nothing about need, save some little noted work by Bastiat in the last century and by Professor Champernoun in this. The mainstream of academic economics has had nothing to say. The reason for this is that it is assumed right away at the outset that the market automatically indicates human needs. A much used textbook of the 30s distinguished for its obsequious, obsequious but lucid exposition of acceptable doctrine writes. One intermediary buys from another in the hope that, after transforming the commodity into a form suitable for satisfying wants, he in turn will be able to sell it at a profit. The chain may be very long, but always at the end of it stands the final consumer, who buys the consumer's goods. We conclude, therefore, that the rationale of economic activity is to satisfy human wants by producing consumer's goods. This said, the whole question of wants and needs is, from the standpoint of economic theory, closed. The human being's needs are treated as a given factor, a sort of instinctive endowment. Armed with this, he or she enters the marketplace as buyer and seller to put in unwanted work, disutility, and take out wanted commodities, utility. If wants can be satisfied, the market will produce them. If they cannot, their non-availability non on the market or non-purchasability will signal this fact. If, that is, the market is working properly. If it is not, then the economist is the expert who advises on how to repair it. So the whole of economic science becomes the study in health and sickness of these market mechanisms mediated by money. This was also the arena for Karl Marx's economic studies but there was an important difference. At the outset, he suspected deep flaws in this commodity market system. True, it swept away the brutishness, cruelty, and superstition of land ownership with serfdom. But as he wrote in the early days when he was trying to think out the problems to which it was most necessary to orientate his research, we have seen what significance given socialism, the wealth of human need has and what significance, therefore, both a new mode of production and a new object of production have, a new manifestation of the forces of human nature and a new enrichment of human nature. Under private property, their significance is reversed. Every person speculates on creating a new need in another so as to drive him to a fresh sacrifice, place him in a new dependence and to seduce him into a new mode of gratification and therefore economic ruin. Each tries to establish over the other an alien power, so as thereby to find satisfaction of his own selfish need. The increase in the quantity of objects is accompanied by an extension of the realm of the alien powers to which man is subjected, and every new product represents a new possibility of mutual swindling and mutual plundering. Man becomes ever poorer as man, his need for money becomes ever greater if he wants to overpower hostile beings. The power of his money declines, so to say, in inverse proportion to the increase in the volume of production. That is, his neediness grows as the power of money increases. 
The need for money is therefore the true need produced by the modern economic system, and it is the only need which the latter produces. And later on, Marx adds, money is the pimp between man's need and the object, between his life and his means of life. In a world still swearing by Adam Smith in free trade, critical analysis of this money system, this commodity or market system was the crucial essential means towards opening a way to a new mode of production. This critical analysis Marx made a life work, the Grandries and Capital, and it constituted an overwhelmingly powerful proof that the commodity-based structure of capitalism would have to be superseded by some new social structure if the needs of men and women as human beings are to be met. The commodity, money, capital, the economy, i.e. the whole development process of market relations, which the academic economists assume must automatically reflect human needs, far from satisfying human needs, in fact, makes this devoutly to be wished goal, goal less and less attainable. True, all sorts of new powers and forces are released as the processes of the capital and money system unfold with the whole world as their arena, but these forces are out of control. The problem is to harness and control them. For all their horrors, we may well allow that these explosive new economic forces have galvanized new human activities and opened new potentialities, freeing human beings from the oppressive torpor of earlier societies. But now they threaten to destroy the species, maybe in a holocaust, maybe person by person, psychologically as much as physically. The historical explosion of industrial capitalism can be nothing but a transitional process. Raising at once the question, after the commodity, money, market economy, what? If an economy structure on a commodity relations fails to meet the really human needs of human beings, what structure of social and economic relations can take its place? Out of our present mess, where is it that we are trying to get? This is the really important question not because we can leap all at once into some brave new world, but because we need to find a direction however we move, step by step, inch by inch, or mile by mile, as opportunities occur. Otherwise, we just go on going round in circles. Marx's analysis and our present experiences of this socio-economic structure of capitalism demonstrate that its problems are not peripheral and correctable, but are rooted in the structure itself. They become more and more acute as time goes on. If this failing structure is one based on the socio-economic relations of commodity exchange, to what new structural forms should we change and how? This question cannot be answered until we think far more deeply and see far more clearly what our real needs as human beings are and recognize the forms of distortion and perversion to which the socio-economy of capitalism subjects our humanity. We talk glibly of socialism as production for use. This is meaningful as posing an antithesis to production for the market. A thing is useful because it meets a human need. Adam Smith taught that the market would inform the producer what he should produce. If the market is set aside or used only subordinately, who decides what is to be produced and how? What are the really human needs of real, really human activity? The great value of Agnes Heller's work is that it opens the way to thinking far more deeply and far more clearly about human needs and the importance of this concept in the shaping of Marx's analysis. For in this respect, Marx has been sorely misunderstood, not least by Marxists. The very scientific quality of his analysis of the contemporary phase of human society has been, as it were, turned against him and that people continue to follow him talking about what is and was, and they seem to have lost sensitivity to the fact that historical forces, the living activities and consciousness of people, are pressing hard against the natural trends of the market and commodity system. The time has come to be more concerned with the alternative. 
how to organize the essentials of social existence and human survival in such a way as to open better possibilities of satisfying more directly and more simply the real needs of thinking, imagining, active, loving human beings. At the present time, needs, obvious needs are not being met and resources, people and plants that might help to meet them are idle. But it is said we are in an economic crisis. The prime need is to overcome this crisis. Only then can further material needs be tackled. Needs for better education, better health services, better transport, housing, education, and so forth. To deal with the crisis, it is asserted public expenditure must be cut. Well, say some, if that is so, why not cut military expenditure? No, say others, defense is a need overriding all others, and so the argument goes on. But all this is not only a matter of argument, it is a matter of decision taking, and where the decisions are taken is, as a rule, some way distant from the public argument. Underlying the resolution of these immediate problems is the structure of the social system in which they are resolved and the political and economic mechanisms for so doing. There are many questions here to which enough thought has not yet been given. What are needs? How do they arise? Who decides priorities in meeting them? Unemployment, frustration and isolation, hateful and meaningful work, pollution of the atmosphere, the squandering of scarce resources, the stresses and insecurity of modern life, the threat of unthinkable forms of war, the perverted use of advanced science, bureaucratic waste and absurd hierarchies of status and pay. All these ills of the present time are to be set against the undoubted advances in caring public consciousness. Concern for the rights of the workers at work. Recognition, though as yet not far reaching, that in addition to wages and conditions of work, unions and other workers' organizations must concern themselves with the social use of labor. But the attempts to institutionalize these progressive aspirations in a welfare state hooked on to a capitalist market economy, the mixed economy, even where successful, are perilously insecure and constantly open to attack to save the system from the threat of crisis. What is the system that is being saved? Are its needs compatible with caring public consciousness and the needs of democracy? How little thought has been put into the understanding of these basic questions by socialist economists and sociologists, and how closely these questions are related to problems of social change and effective action to achieve change. Agnes Heller's work enables us to think about these problems from the standpoint of socialist theory and to look beyond the restricting structure of capitalism and its market economy. Too much political and economic argument today ends with within the preconceptions of an economic system which is actually controlled by the market and its money system and which is unable itself to control the market and monetary forces that stultify all our efforts to meet the needs of people more effectively. The needs of capital of profitable production oust the needs of people. Adam Smith's Apologia for the Market System, valid enough in its day 200 years ago, argued that the market would automatically discover and meet people's needs. This, even in the past, was only true in a limited sense. But far from the market system overcoming its defects, these are multiplied and ampl amplified within the development of the system and the concentration of capital into increasingly huge units. The development of the system declares very loudly the necessity of treating the socio-economic structure as transitory. This means seeking a deeper understanding of needs and looking for new ways of meeting them. An important aspect of these problems emerges from the ecological debate, which has rightly received a great deal of attention. The failure of the market mechanisms raises the whole problem of popular participation and social planning to a new level of urgency. The wisdom of allowing market forces to determine unfettered the rate of use of scarce natural resources is today being questioned with far greater insistence than was formerly the case. Entrepreneurs cite the market as their alibi for the systematic misuse of materials and also of people. 
but today more people come back at them saying so much the worse for the market. However, even before this recent growth of concern about the market system's destruction of the human environment, demand for great extensions of democratic power was already becoming urgent. During the post-war years, state intervention in the administration of privately controlled economies has increased greatly. Concomitantly, publicly controlled enterprise and welfare provision of public services has also increased creating large sectors of advanced economies, which could be made less subordinate to market pressures. This area of public control could serve to a certain extent as a counter influence to the free operation of the market. It cannot be said that much has yet been achieved in this respect since there is extraordinary confusion about the principles and objectives that should guide non-market enterprises. However, this has resulted in a notable revival of concern with the concept of need as distinct from the conventional economic notion of demand which has dominated social thinking as long as the rationality of the market remained virtually unchallenged. Of course, the system based on market and monetary criteria is the only system that the higher echelons of the hierarchies of power are familiar with. It is also the social structure best adapted to the maintenance and support of their hierarchical status. They find it hard to think of alternatives and are hardly likely to encourage any exploration of alternatives but the needs of people and the impact of developing democratic forces to express these needs bring new pressures to bear on the market structure. The imagined sovereignty of demand is obviously linked with the hegemony of desired hegemony of the market over all socioeconomic decisions. The conventional distinction between effective demand and its implied ghost, non-effective demand, which would be sheer nonsense within any strict interpretation of market-based economic models, reflects an uneasy, if usually incomplete, recognition of the human or social inadequacy of, the mo of that model. It has long been generally recognized, for instance, that market forces alone will never meet the housing need, or the health need, or large sectors of the population working in even the most successful market economies. The evolution of market capitalism has bellied the more rosy hopes of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. Wealth is concentrated in huge multinational enterprises. Resources are badly allocated and income inequality distributed within the markets or an income in, resources are badly allocated and income unequally distributed. Within the market's sway, larger or lesser groups of people lack the resources to translate some of their basic needs into effective demand. Hence the growth of public provision and of watchful underdog pressure groups in all the major economies. Orthodox economists were not always blind to these difficulties. And Marshall, for instance, troubled himself with the distinction not only between necessities and other commodities, but also between the necessities of efficiency and the necessities of existence. But whilst all necessities were either provided in the marketplace or not at all, it remained an abstract preoccupation and need was condemned to seem a phantom idea outside the writings of utopians and socialists. Today in the self-styled welfare states, the existence of a large infrastructure of local authority housing at more or less subsidized rents of a free or poll tax contributory health service, of extended facilities for public education, has revitalized the awareness of need as distinct from, and often as opposed to, demand. The Sebum Report in Britain, for instance, gave semi-official status to the idea that the personal social services are large-scale experiments in ways of helping those in need. Yet, what is need? In the argument of the current poverty lobby in Britain, and above all of the writers associated with the Child Poverty Action Group, there has been a consistent tendency to stress individual need as something that the individual learns, and to worry away not only at Marshall's distinction between necessities of different kinds, but also the distinction between necessities and what other conventional economists call comforts or even luxuries. Undoubtedly, the material basis for such a sustained intellectual offensive has been the non-market area of publicly provided social security. A French study has made an effort to quantify the growth of this public sector need provision. 
The Center for Research and Documentation on Consumer Affairs has identified three kinds of needs. Elementary needs, such as food, clothing, toiletries, etc. Environmental needs, such as housing, leisure, transport, and needs related to the person, such as education, sports, health, cultural provision. They then attempted to aggregate the expenditures in each category, which were made in the open market, the cost of freely provided public services, and those other costs which were refunded by Social Security services. Their findings offer an interesting perspective. Um, there's a chart. Of course, many questions remain to be asked within this framework. We cannot assume that these expenditures are uniform for all social groups, and the variations between one group and another can tell us extremely significant things about the social structure concerned. What remains very clear is that public provision taken at its most, at its own valuation, has different motors for market orientation production. Commonly, the social services create or discover needs which hitherto had never been imagined by the governors of society, and possibly not even by some of the beneficiaries of the process. In the field of adult education, poor as it is in endowments, this is a truism but it can also be held relevant in many other areas in the newly formed British National Health Service. The original heavy demand for false teeth and spectacles triggered off a celebrated public controversy once these items became freely available. It was argued at the time that this rush for aid reflected the privation previously imposed by the system of market provision on those too poor or too mean to exercise effective demand. But in a similar way, the elaboration of medical technology constantly creates new and newer needs, some of them involving far more investment than teeth and glasses. No one could need a kidney machine until there was one. Another interesting example is speech therapy. Roughly half a million people in Britain stammer, 0.8% of the population. It had been calculated that perhaps 400,000 of these people are seriously affl afflicted. There are 900 full-time and 500 part-time speech therapists. A recent inquiry published in The Guardian asked 30 local education authorities how many adult classes they held for adult stammerers. It turned out that there were three adult evening classes in the whole country. As the author of this study points out, this educational development is therefore in the hands of local stammerers and potential tutors who must come out, out of their individual non-entity and organize themselves into a recognizable body. Need, that is to say, is not merely learned by imitation and diffused by social osmosis. Awareness of it can be consciously communicated, the more so when remedies are on hand, but also to some extent when they are technically possible, even if not actually available. The emergence of needs and the means of meeting them in such a way stands in sharp contrast to market demand stimulated by advertisements and accorded priority by the individual's purse. Inevitably, public provision raises problems about the allocation of scarce resources that call for new criteria and methods of settlement. In Britain, the Nottinghamshire County Council recently attracted serious adverse criticism when it appointed a pocket money advisor to organize consumer advice for children in schools. The appointment was, of course, open to debate, although some at least of the consumer groups would have welcomed it. The question is, by what criteria should such de decisions be made? How does one hitherto unrecognized need secure priority over another? Who decides subject to what community controls. Gunnar Myrtle, in his interesting study Beyond the Welfare State, points out that the institutions of welfare in the West have grown up in a democratic environment, in, in distinction from the mechanisms of planning in the USSR and other communist countries, which came into existence in the context of an authoritarian political framework. Unfortunately, however, the soil in which welfare has grown does not mean that it, that it necessarily retains democratic properties itself. 
we have certainly not succeeded in rendering the public social services democratic in themselves, either in the sense of asserting direct popular participation in and control of them, or in the more fundamental and indispensable sense of subjecting them to effective and satisfying detailed public accountability. Indeed, there are many examples of the avowed purposes of social welfare institutions being stultified by centralization and hierarchical organization, and by the use of administrative criteria borrowed from enterprises whose objective is profitability in the market. Part of the problem can be seen in one of the most interesting studies of the taxonomy of need published in New Society by Jonathan Bradshaw. Bradshaw is rightly concerned about the amorphousness of the concepts of need, and in an effort towards clarity, separates four distinct definitions. First, he identifies the idea of normative need, which may be summarized as the bureaucratic determination by an, by an administration or social scientists of minimum levels of adequacy. These norms may be matched by remedial provision, or they may not. Examples he offers include the British Medical Association's Nutritional Standard or Peter Townsend's Incapacity Scale. Much progress has been made in defining such norms in the fields of housing and education during recent years. Secondly, he recognizes felt need as the stated wants of those for whom services are offered. Thirdly, he lists expressed needs or demand, not in the economic sense, in which the lack of something will provoke action demanding service. Examples he offers include hospital waiting lists or possibly housing waiting lists. Finally, he accepts the idea of comparative need, in which either persons or areas are compared with others and found to lack amenities, which are generally accepted as necessary elsewhere. Bradshaw then goes on to offer a model connecting these different concepts. The model interrelates those more or less precise measures of need which may be elaborated on the basis of each one taken individually. The important thing about this whole valuable exercise is that it is directed exclusively at planners and policy makers to enable them to refine and evaluate their judgments. And it is exactly this need of the planners which demonstrates how far our services are from being able to live up to Gunnar Myrtle's expectations about their democratic content, since effective participation and consultation would by themselves produce notable refinements in most public plans, as well as allowing planners to educate themselves in the process. The relevance of this problem to the wider ecological issues demanding as they do significant extensions of planning in order to eke out scarce materials, to research and develop substitutes and to clear up and prevent mess should be evident. Democratic forms of society will be increasingly difficult to maintain unless we can effectively extend the principles of social accountability and direct popular participation in decision making to what are, at present, either authoritarian or technocratic preserves. Naturally, this is not to argue against development of technique, which is no more urgent than ever, but to argue for its application to what people themselves regard as the most important issues. In response to democratic initiative under genuinely de democratic control. At this point, one must obviously consider the tools which are available for such controls. The growth of governmental and local administrative organs, voluntary organizations, trade unions, and pressure groups certainly provides us with a confusion of institutions. What is required is not simply a refinement of organizational forms, and still less a proliferation of offices in the hierarchy of bureaucratic institutions. It would be more fruitful to seek solutions in an enrichment of the simple traditional constitutional doctrine of the separation of powers, such as might prove possible once we began to take the notion of accountability seriously. Any genuine separation of powers exists to prevent the concentration of authority in a manner harmful to civil, to civil liberties. 
bitter experience in a succession of countries reveals the peril of minimizing the importance of the continuous extension of checks and controls to cope with the enormous growth of bureaucratic administrative forms. The fact that public provision for welfare needs outside the effective demand of the market could only be initiated through bureaucratic forms of administration in no way removes the necessity now to move towards democratic forms with all possible speed. Not to do so will, will result in waste of resources and the discrediting of welfare as a more advanced social objective than market efficiency. In its pure form, this problem poses itself most clearly in the socialist societies, where planning is unimpeded by the institutions of private property, but where democratic initiatives are as yet markedly limited and indeed restricted. This has been perceptively understood by Mihailo Markovic, the Yugoslav scholar, dismissed with his colleagues in the Belgrade School of Philosophy after an unprecedented governmental campaign culminating in an arbitrary decision by state authorities of Serbia to overrule the university statutes. At the beginning of 1975, against the will of their colleagues, the Belgrade philosophers were suspended from teaching duties. Markovic argues that the doctrine of separation of powers needs now to be consciously applied to information and communication services so that, not so that not only raw data, but also access to competent and, if necessary, adverse technical advice should become available to groups of citizens as of right for whatever social purposes might be relevant to them. In capitalist economies, the resistance to such doctrines has a dual root, in contrast to the single bureaucratic political source of limitations on the information flows which control the communist states. Capitalist societies encourage a certain dissociative pluralism in the communications media and in the fields of intellectual organization, although they have given rise to a bureaucracy in both local and national government and their outstations, which is not without its East European parallel. But the major ob obstacle to freedom of information is still, in such societies, undoubtedly located in the institutions of private property which require not only material producer goods, but certain kinds of knowledge to be restricted to more or less exclusive proprietorship. Moreover, the outlook of private property and market needs dominates research and training in institutions of learning. To establish truly universal access to knowledge would be to negate the, the domination of resources by particular interests. And it is this salient fact which in the capitalist countries has encouraged the industrial demand for accountability, often pursued under the slogan, open the books. Needless to say, this is not to argue that universal access to knowledge can be achieved without other prior material changes. George Orwell pinpointed this question with characteristic clarity when he wrote of the proles. Until they become conscious, they will never rebel, and until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. While the problem is confined solely to human consciousness, it is insoluble. So everything comes back to a deeper understanding of human needs in relation to social structures, to the theory to which Agnes Heller's work makes a basic contribution. The difficulty is to escape from the much repeated preconception that economics is coterminous with money and markets. This is the pen in which Professor Pigou, the author of the famous uh, The Economics of Welfare, locked himself in three generations of academic economists concerned with welfare. Economic welfare, he wrote, is the subject matter of economic science. This indeed is what we all wish it to be, but it is rendered impossible immediately by the terms of of reference that he and the other economists impose upon themselves. The range of our inquiry becomes restricted to that part of social welfare that can be brought directly or indirectly into relation with the measuring rod of money. Socialists, including Marxist socialists, have all eagerly tended to confine their vision with the same blinkers. 
They seem to have missed entirely the critical motivation that launched Marx on the study of the political economy of commodity production. Capital was a critical analysis of a structure of economic relationships doomed, whatever its temporary achievements as a springboard for future social development, to fail as a stable structure capable of meeting the human needs of human beings.